Hello YouTube, Sandre here. And this is going to be the last video on Jordan Peterson, at least for now, because right now I don't find any reason to make any more videos on the guy. But that might change in the future. He might make some kind of public statement in the future where I feel like I have to start responding again, but until then, no, this is the last one. Today we're going to talk about his postmodernist approach to anti-postmodernism. You see, for someone who talks so much about postmodernism, and its pitfalls. Jordan doesn't seem to understand to a large degree what postmodernism even is. And ironically, when he's arguing, he often employs postmodernist tactics in terms of his rhetoric. This will become apparent later on. Now, before this video begins, let me just make two things very clear. I'm not a postmodernist, and I'm not a Marxist. I've never subscribed to any of these ideas, and I'm not a fan of either of them. I'm just making this clear because Jordan Peterson's fans seem to think that just because you criticize the guy, you by default have to belong to the other side, so to speak. Trust me, I don't. I've made plenty of videos against the postmodernist crowd, as well as against Marxists. Just because I criticize Peterson doesn't mean that I belong to the same crowd who usually criticizes him. But for now, let's take a look at some common claims that Jordan Peterson has done regarding postmodernism. I share with Jordan my disdain for postmodernism. But even though I agree with Jordan that postmodernism is for the most part a bad thing, I don't agree with the points he makes against it because it's clear that he doesn't understand what postmodernism actually is. And like I said, he actually employs a lot of postmodernist rhetorical vices himself in his arguments. Which, like it or not, makes him a hypocrite. So let's begin. In this video, we're going to go through a couple of common claims that he makes about postmodernism, and I'm going to try and do my best as to show how he's wrong. The, the postmodernist types is they're nested inside Marxism. So what they did instead, being highly intelligent individuals, was play a game of sleight of hand and transformed these Marxist presuppositions into postmodernism in the 1970s. The sleight of hand was, oh, well, fine, we'll just play a different oppressor versus oppressed game and we'll introduce identity politics. They transformed the Marxist dialogue of, of rich versus poor into oppressed versus oppressor. In brief, I think what they did was, in the late 60s and early 70s, they were avowed Marxists um, way, way after anyone with any shred of ethical decency had stopped being a Marxist. By that time, even Jean-Paul Sartre had woken up enough to figure out that the Soviets hadn't ushered in the kingdom of heaven. Derrida was also, and Derrida in some ways is even a more treacherous thinker because he makes the claim in some sense that like a political system has a center around which the majority congregate, let's say, it's, it's, it's quite similar to, to Foucault's analysis and that there are, there are people who are outside the category system and then, which is obviously true because no matter how you categorize people, there are certain people inside the category and certain people outside. That's actually why you categorize things. And you can't just scrap categorization because without simplification and categorization, you actually can't function in the world. Um, then, Fu you know, uh, Derrida went, and Foucault as well, went a step farther. And this is one of the incredibly crooked elements of their thinking, I think. Another sleight of hand, which was, well, category systems exclude, political systems exclude, economic systems exclude, any hierarchy of value excludes, obviously, because if there was a hierarchy of value, some things are more valuable than others, and the less valuable things are excluded, because otherwise it wouldn't be a hierarchy of value. But the, the next claim they essentially make is that the reason that those hierarchies of value are constructed isn't to produce whatever it is that's of value, but to exclude and to maintain the structure of power that's intrinsic to the hierarchy of value. One common claim that Peterson makes over and over again is that Marxism had to be disguised in academia as it just couldn't be defended anymore and claim that Foucault and Derrida are the architects of postmodernism, first of all, the timeline just doesn't make any sense. Foucault published his first noteworthy work in 1961, and Derrida in 1967. During this time, 
the political activity of communism was very much alive in Europe. Especially in France, where actually the Communist Party was the third largest. To be openly communist during this time may have meant scorn from the majority of the population within the nations that you were in, but Marxist ideas were not scoffed at enough to warrant the idea that people had to hide Marxism by dressing it up in postmodernism. There would simply be no need to do so. Socialist ideas were very much mainstream during this time, and this became noticeable in most of Europe throughout the 60s and early 70s. And like I said, the third largest party in France during this time when these works came out was actually the Communist Party. People who were outspoken Marxists. There was no need to hide Marxism by dressing it up as postmodernism. Now, this idea that postmodernism is just Marxism in disguise has been broadcast by Jordan Peterson on numerous occasions. Not only does Jordan Peterson have a very simplified view of Marxism, as well as of postmodernism, but actually most Marxists are vehement anti-postmodernists. Yes, most Marxists, especially in academia, have harsh criticism to lay against postmodernism. That could start by saying something like this. Postmodernism embodies dead as an explicit research program in universities. Nobody sits around anymore trying to theorize what features define postmodernism or what shatteringly new realities justify calling our life and times postmodern. Really, no longer can you get tenure or even a tiny salary increase on the basis of marketing or recycling uh, a, view, a new view of postmodernity. But if that's the case, you're probably wondering why am I giving this talk? Um, is it really such an important topic, or has this session been scheduled merely to satisfy some antiquarian interest? Uh, well, the truth is that while postmodernism may be dead, it remains unburied. It lives on like a zombie, devoid of a beating heart, but compelled, uh, <clears throat> compelled by some unconscious energy to stalk the planet with ruthless design. By this, of course, I mean that despite the decline of its academic cachet, postmodernism has become the hegemonic boxer of our time. Um, it survives as our common sense, that is, as an ideology embedded like a tick within the flesh of our brains, and, and it manifests itself everywhere uh, from the classroom to Occupy. Now, that's a very unpostmodernist way to start out my talk. So if, I, if I were a postmodernist, I'd start it out a little more uh, like this, um, kind of uh, heralding uh, uh, the advent of a new historical epic. And I'd use apocalyptic terms and tones in order to uh, proclaim the coming of this period. And if I uh, uh, were doing that, I'd want to go out of my way to invent a really informative name for this new period, something like post postmodernism. You know? uh, a spanky fresh period in human history, uh, um, something like post postmodernism, I would claim, displays a number of features that will astonish you, since they are no doubt incredible and unprecedented. <laughs> Let me describe post postmodernism. Class warfare, conducted on a global scale, bounds the post postmodernist epic, fueled by profiteering, post postmodernism is used for cauldrons of environmental degradation, gnawing at nature like a termite bent on seeing only a clogged chimney survive the house. In the post postmodernist period, reforms that promise freedom from racial, gender, and national oppression uh, suffer continuous attacks and sometimes painful defeats. The failure to win reforms under post postmodernism once and for all through revolution condemns them to an anxious insecurity. A similarly precarious condition shapes the lived experience of the vast majority of humans on the planet, especially the young, you know, whose future looms ominous. And finally, despite all its harsh realities, post-postmodernism excretes a phantasmagorical reverie uh, in which the most basic truths about contemporary social and individual life are obscured, distorted, and mystified by politicians and intellectuals alike, those, quote, amusing and perfectly self-conscious charlatans, to cite the uh, uh, in defining postmodernists, uh, who are to be found on both the right and the left. But hold your purses, you would do well to interrupt me, you know? You're not you're saying me, you're not describing a new period of history at all. We've seen every bit of this before. In fact, we've been living it in increasing measure ever since capitalism triumphed over feudalism. You're simply remarking the dark underbelly of capitalism. Now, if you were to say that to me, if you had a good sense of fortitude to utter that objection, uh, I might surprise you by immediately agreeing. But then I would want to ask you, what does it imply for our, under our understanding of the self-proclaimed epic known as postmodernism or postmodernity to affirm that these characteristics define post-postmodern modernity just as they define modernity even before postmodernity? In fact, these characteristics are shared across roughly two centuries of I know you're expecting the word capitalism again, but I want to appear to be a vulgar Marxist. Uh, so allow me to mint an unimaginative term and call it two centuries of post feudalism. <laughs> so, how then does the ongoing existence of the characteristics I enumerated above affect the claim that postmodernism represents a radical break with the society that preceded it? Indeed, if exploitation, oppression, and environmental degradation doggedly persists in what I have jokingly called a post postmodernist period, how exactly have postmodernism and postmodernity changed the world? Now, in offering some answers to these questions, I'd like to focus on three areas in which the ideas offered by postmodernism prove inadequate and altogether debilitating to the political project of making an anti capitalist, by which I mean a socialist, revolution. We may find these areas as postmodernism's conceptualization of one, history, two, individual subjectivity, that is what the individuals look like and how they made, and agents of social change, and three, the nature of power and the road to revolution. For our discussion, I'll use the terms postmodern and postmodernity more or less interchangeably when referring to the array of concepts and positions for which they normally serve as shorthand. For our purposes today, we need not distinguish between them overly much. We need only to clarify that postmodernism is both a particular aesthetic practice, that is an artistic style, as well as, and more importantly, a form of cultural consciousness. 
In this latter sense, postmodernism uh, qualifies to employ Raymond Williams's vocabulary as a structure of feeling. A structure of feeling can be emergent or dominant, but in either case, it comprises, a fundamental, uh, it comprises the fundamental values, behavioral dispositions, and emotional atmosphere of certain groups of people living in certain time, living at certain times. For this part, the term postmodern postmodernity remains strictly a periodizing concept. Most often, it is used to mark the end of something called modernity and the beginning of whatever we understand uh, to be a condition of our contemporary life in society. Now, our evaluation of postmodernism can most profitably begin by <clears throat> Examining the historical context in which postmodernism arises. As many other Marxists have argued, especially uh, Terry Eagleton and Alex Lindpost, postmodernism emerges from the ashes of the defeats experienced by radical social movements during potentially revolutionary peoples of the 1960s and 1970s. Although similar events characterized the national landscapes of countries such as Portugal, Spain, Paraguay, Iran, and Poland, the French made in 1968 serves as the most common reference point condensing the overall dynamic of these defeats. Indeed, the French made in 1968 proved decisive in the formation and subsequent permeation of postmodern consciousness throughout the whole of society in both Western Europe and the United States, as well as in important sectors of the global intelligentsia in Latin America and South Asia. During the French May and on government orders, armed police brutally repressed Parisian University and high school students who were demonstrating against the American imperialist war in Vietnam. Remember here that France had recently engaged in its own war to thwart Vietnamese self or national self-determination. The majority of the families of the students being clubbed and tear gassed belonged to the working class. They were shot and angered by the injuries and arrests suffered by their children, sisters, and brothers under the whip of state violence. Soon the French working class, 10 million strong, joined the struggle alongside the students um, declaring a general strike across the nation. Economic activity, commerce, transportation, the production of goods and services all ceased abruptly, and the government of then President Charles de Gaulle uh, trembled on its foundation. De Gaulle and the National Assembly even sought refuge in neighboring Germany, uh, fully expecting to see the settlement collapse. State power lived like a loose coin on the street, waiting to be, treated, be retrieved by an eagle eyed pauper. The possibility for anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist revolution thus materialized for a few days. The moment had arrived when ordinary French working people could embark upon a genuinely revolutionary process. As we know, this did not happen. What or who destroyed the revolutionary conjuncture and pulled France back from the brink of popular transformation? The political forces on the left, who were the protagonists of the French May, included anarchists, communists, and socialists. But the strongest organization was the General Confederation of Labor, the CGT, which maintained an affiliation with the French Communist Party, the PCF. The PCF, like Stalinized communist parties around the world, feared any spontaneous popular rebellion, and especially a revolution they could not control from above. Hence, the leaders of the PCF collaborated with the Gulf government to restore order and to re-stabilize the French state. Rank and file members of the CTT received instructions to abandon the general strike and to stop their demonstrations against the government and in support of the students. The withdrawal of militant action on the part of the French working class consigned the student movement to an inevitable defeat. While students can do much to start a revolt, they lack economic and social power to topple the system on their own. You can imagine the effect that betrayal by the leaderships of the PCF and the CGT had on French students, and among them, the current and next generation of French intellectuals. Such renowned future postmodernists including Michel Foucault, André Goutson, Christine Boussy, Jacques Aguilar, Julia Cresseva, Jean Baudrillard, Gilles Leleuze, and Jacques Rancière were studying, teaching, or otherwise engaging in dialogue with Marxism, often in its Chinese variant, in places such as the École Normale Supérieure and the University of Paris 8. Many of the time company influenced by the structural Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser, to whom they looked for support in challenging BCS Stalinism, but who then disappointed them by keeping silent throughout the French Maine. So it was that the main events provoked a catastrophic disillusionment with revolutionary Marxism. Not only had the largest self-styled Marxist Leninist party sold out the aspirations of rebellious workers and students, but the most prestigious voice associated with Communist Party dissidents had proven incapable of rising to the historical moment. The French May, as well as similar events in other countries throughout the period of 1968 to 1981, created the emotional crucible out of which so-called postmodern sensibility emerged. Postmodern sensibility, as I've already uh, suggested, is a structure of feeling. We can now specify its dominant tonality as one which is saturated by irony, cynicism, and often apathy. We should not be the least surprised that such attitudes are directed at Marxism with special intensity, and generally at any set of ideas that promises or predicts or otherwise holds out hope for a revolutionary transformation of society. In terms of social and cultural theory, the first target of the emerging ideology of postmodernism becomes the entity Jean-François Lyot labels the grand narratives in his book, The Postmodern Condition, which was published in 1979. Grand narratives follow the pattern of the Judeo-Christian narrative of the existence of fate of humans in the universe. This story applies in origin, God creates the world in seven days, and several landmark events that fulfill the providential design, such as expulsion from the Garden of Eden, the world work, screwing over the Israelites, then elevating them, then screwing them over again, uh, sending Jesus to atone for original sin, or possible our redemption, plaguing us with death along the way until we reach the final apocalypse, uh, rapturing a few of us and broiling the rest of you, uh, and then the jackpot uh, of an eternal life, singing to and venerating the Creator in some strange place where apparently there is no beer. Leotard and most other postmodernists, of course, uh, don't waste, don't really waste their time debunking the philosophically suspect nature of the Judeo Christian narrative. Yet they detect in this religious narrative all of the elements that characterize two narratives which obsessively draw their fire. These narratives, of course, are provided by the German philosopher G.W.F. Hegel and his most famous young student, Karl Marx. What do Hegel and Marx share with the authors of the Bible? Simply put, they tell a story with an identifiable origin or beginning, a plot which unfolds in a linear series of events, and an outcome which, inexorably from, which surfaces inexorably from the logic implicit in the origin and its successive development. The understanding, and I put that in quotation marks, of Marxism elaborated about those modernism, is that Marxism projects a view of history that envisions history as mechanical, that is linear with a singular beginning, and predestined to a determinate 
and that is, it's still illogical in the big word T loss and right, that is it's kind of uh, deterministic, uh, inevitable uh, process built into it. And what does it look like? Well, in Marx, they say it's primitive communism and the development of surpluses and the constant division of society into classes, a logical pre programmed series of stages of history, including slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism, and finally, the coming of the promised land, communism, the return of a classless utopia, with the only difference of it from the uh, Christian heaven being that communism, there most assuredly is beer and it's free. For those of you who have been active as Marxists for uh, any period of time, really, it's been very long. <coughs> You'll inevitably have been confronted with phrases along the lines of, like, oh, we need that to be a bit more nuanced than this. You know, things are very complex. Um, Marxism is a bit out of date, uh, actually, isn't it? Old fashioned. It's very, very reductionist. Um, it reduces everything to just economics, basically, and is, is very kind of uh, controlling uh, in its you know, way that it sees the world. Um, these are typical kind of postmodernist um, lines of reasoning, or not even really lines of reasoning, they're more just sort of ways of expecting facts, which is basically what it boils down to. And, um, you also be familiar with other terms like discourse, uh, the emphasis on difference, always emphasising the differences between things. And also in general, in the modern era, or postmodern era, a tendency uh, towards uh, cynicism and irony, you know, um, or sort of pseudo-irony, you know, just sort of sneering at things. Especially anything that's um, very earnest or, or sincere, is that's about the most embarrassing thing you could possibly be. I think these things, we're also one clear enough familiar with this kind of air of, this kind of atmosphere that hangs around, especially uh, on the left or on the academic left. And, uh, and really that's the influence of postmodernism. And um, postmodernism is very important for us to understand, because, um, first of all, I would say it's probably the dominant uh, mode of attack that ruling class has had in terms of theory. On Marxism over the last 30 or so years. And um, so yeah, it's been really kind of the ideology, I suppose, over the last 20 or 30 years um, in the main. And also, I, it, that's perhaps waning now, but in the current situation, identity politics is clearly heavy. Many people who are closer to it actually they are postmodernists. But it's clearly bears the stamp of postmodernism and the influence of postmodernism. Um, and that's obviously a huge um, uh, influence on the, on the especially on the student left, so that's something that we need to understand. Now, how do we understand postmodernism? Because it's, it's to a point of principle, it's extremely eclectic. Uh, and it's, it's self-contradictory, uh, almost deliberately so. In fact, it sometimes is deliberately self-contradictory. It um, doesn't really make sense much of the time. And it, in fact, it excuses the idea of making sense uh, or of rationality in many respects. And so it's hard to define. Um, you couldn't really boil it down to sort of any coherent ideas in a sense. And uh, mainly, it finds itself in opposition to what it calls modernism. Which we have to say uh, is a term I think we should reject, because modernism is not a Marxist or a scientific term. But basically, what they mean when they reject modernism is they reject uh, progress or the, the idea of progress, the idea, you know, the idea that exists in different political ideologies that humanity makes progress over time, uh, or the bourgeois enlightenment, the rejection of to get science and reject rationality um, as, as uh, you know, these passive things, basically. And objectivity as a category is also frequently uh, rejected. So, Pokemon is really more than what it rejects. It sees these things, you know, science, science, rationality, the idea of progress as being prominent in the Western world over the last two or three hundred years, and basically says uh, that they're wrong or that they're passe or something like that, and they need to be superseded. I would say that therefore the way we should really categorize both modernism and modernism, uh, in much terms of the ideas themselves, uh, which we reject, so I don't think modernism really is an idea, or a test of ideas, but we should look at this from historical materialist point of view and understand that what this really references is two great phases of capitalism. That is to say, modernism broadly corresponds to the progressive phase of capitalism, the phase in which capitalism was growing, with developing the class forces in a very meaningful way, uh, and taking society forwards. And then the period roughly coinciding with the beginning of the First World War, accelerating at different points in history in which capitalism begins to decline, uh, goes into phase of deindustrialization, um, and you know, everything we've been familiar with in the last uh, sort of 30 or so years in particular. Um, the reason we check the term modernism, um, which the postmodernists use in a very flippant way, um, is that it lumps together wildly different things. And from both modernism, Marxism and liberalism are both modernism and a kind of thing, really, because they both believe in progress in science. And in doing so, do incredible disservice to Marxism, whose understanding of science is far more complex and nuanced, to use very uh, postmodernist kind of terms, uh, than, than was liberalism. Uh, and of course, the opposing class points of view, liberalism, of course, is really the ideology of capitalism and of the ruling class. And Marxism, obviously, is that socialism, the working class. So you just lump the two together like that is, is, uh, is extremely bad. Nevertheless, there is a certain, as I said, there is a certain uh, um, reason they've done so, which is that both those ideologies were born really a phase in which capitalism uh, was in the ascendancy. Um, <coughs> anyway, so postmodernism technically begins much later, but the first tendency towards I think can be seen in particular with Nietzsche, uh, who is an enormous influence on many postmodernists. And that's not a coincidence that it is Nietzsche, because Nietzsche obviously was writing at the end of the 19th century when capitalism was perhaps beginning to bear signs of its, of its impasse, you know, of the, the gross excesses of industrialization, you know, the slums in cities. And, and what Nietzsche really um, reflected was the pessimism about science and about progress. And he was considered himself seen as an irrationalist, someone who rejected the idea of an objective world, really, and all false science, basically. Um, and he sees science as a means to control people. And obviously, in doing so, he was reflecting a bit of realization that much of science, um, or the much of the effects of science in the 19th century, and of course, especially in the 20th century, were used for violent and oppressive means rather than to liberate people. And so he's a very important thinker, but he's not strictly. It's not postmodernist, but it really reflects the same kind of process. And in the early 20th century, you have a number of um, thinkers uh, who are not postmodernist again, but begin to use the term post within the postmodern era. Of course, it's the era of the Great Depression and the two world wars. And you have growing pessimism basically seeping in uh, to, to the ruling class. And these thinkers I'm referring to are ruling class thinkers. They were mainly very conservative to people first using the term postmodern. They were not aligned with anything progressive at all. And in fact, they hated the modern world. They saw it as filthy and dirty and unpleasant, basically. And wanted to go back to the more old fashioned values. Um, they, they, they were reflecting this pessimism about the way society was going, which obviously reflected the impasse of capitalism, especially in that era. Then after the Second World War, you have a few more intellectuals saying similar things. Uh, Peter Drucker, for instance, identified quite pressingly uh, both modernism with the post-industrial epoch. And I say pressingly because, of course, in the 1950s, which is when he was writing, um, post-industrialism, or like deindustrialization, hadn't really begun properly uh, in countries like Britain and America. If he anticipated it and could see, could, could see that there was something to change or would begin to change in society. And uh, kind of an atmosphere of nihilism among certain intellectuals began to spread. Nietzsche himself was often seen as a sort of harbinger of nihilism as well. Um, 
uh, yeah, there's enormous pessimism seeping in. And, and also, as um, the boom, both for boom, and the success of Keynesianism, uh, Fordism really began to decline. Uh, and and Cracks began to appear, you know, the inflation he has in, in, uh, in the early 70s. And, uh, you know, and this is picked up in the 60s by a number of thinkers who began to say that science is, uh, doesn't really bring any progress at all. And uh, really, there's no order to reality. Reality is disordered, things are different from each other, and you can't really know the way. If it is the real way that things work, you can't really know the way. It's not really an original idea, but nevertheless, the, the, the sort of pumping up of these ideas in that period did express something. Jeffrey Barakoff in 1964, and uh, this is a very keen model postmodernist, um, really, but it reflected the same kind of tendencies, really hit the nail on the head for how they think. He said, we must stress differences and discontinuity. Whereas um, modernism is characterized by seeing unity in things. In other words, by saying the world is, has these features in you know, a universal way. You know, every country, for instance, is capitalism, capitalism works you know, in a definite way. That would be, for them, too much of a unifying idea, which should stress discontinuity, which should stress something different, and certain laws don't apply from one country to another. Um, and then, just before the postmodern is probably begin, you have other thinkers like Roland Barthes, the Frankfurt School as well, <coughs> and Gilbert, various thinkers who, again, very pessimistic, especially uh, after the Second World War, especially the Frankfurt School, looking at uh, the experience of the Second World War, the nuclear bomb, Holocaust, basically said that science is just doing death, um, and, uh, and uh, the laws of Barthism and the class struggle don't really apply anymore because um, science and the bureaucracy, uh, obviously very much reflecting the post-war boom of the growth in bureaucracy that you had and the nationalisation of many industries, uh, and also the and they said, well, the bureaucracy now has superseded the class struggle, uh, and the interests of science um, and nationality now dominate everything. And there is no real class struggle anymore, or it's been blunted. Um, and uh, we're now basically all just victims of this kind of scientific rationality. Um, this very pessimistic kind of mood, the negative, abandoning all idea of real progress or of, um, of, of socialism. Um, and this, so this, this really began to catch on. And also, <clears throat> another uh, tendency to, to look at things from a cultural point of view, rather than, say, an economic or a political one, is very much um, uh, is something that the Frankfurt School in particular really took on, and is very important to postmodernism. Basically, of course, after the Second World War, you had an explosion in the West of what they called culture industry. In other words, you know, uh, pop music, you know, mass culture, movies, etc. <clears throat> and they basically said, you know, well, this means that everyone's kind of under the ideological control of capitalism now, and there's no real escape, which is bombarded with these images. And that also is something that's very influential on the postmodernists. In turn, a lot of postmodernists are refusing to incorporate any kind of Marxism into their works as well. Derrida doesn't even incorporate the idea of class struggle into his works. Jordan Peterson seems to think that just because postmodernism and Marxism have a somewhat similar buildup of a structure of a narrative, in the sense of the idea of the oppressor and the oppressed, that somehow makes them equivalent, but this is simply not true. And it is a gross oversimplification of both Marxism and postmodernism. It has a center around which the majority congregate, let's say. It's, it's, it's quite similar to, to Foucault's analysis and that there are, there are people who are outside the category system and then, which is obviously true because no matter how you categorize people, there are certain people inside the category and certain people outside. That's actually why you categorize things. And you can't just scrap categorization because without simplification and categorization, you actually can't function in the world. Um, then, Fu you know, uh, Derrida went, and Foucault as well, went a step farther. And this is one of the incredibly crooked elements of their thinking, I think, another sleight of hand, which was, well, category systems exclude, political systems exclude, economic systems exclude, any hierarchy of value excludes, obviously, because if there was a hierarchy of value, some things are more valuable than others, and the less valuable things are excluded, because otherwise it wouldn't be a hierarchy of value. But the, the next claim they essentially make is that the reason that those hierarchies of value are constructed isn't to produce whatever it is that's of value, but to exclude and to maintain the structure of power that's intrinsic to the hierarchy of value. But this is simply not true. I'm going to show you how this is the case with this actual quote by Derrida. I didn't say that there was no center. The center is a function. A reality, but a function. And this function is absolutely indispensable. The subject is also absolutely indispensable. Also, Foucault never once argued that power wants power to exist simply because it wants power to exist. This is a huge oversimplification by Peterson. The argument that Foucault made was that power is necessary to produce knowledge. I quote, Power and knowledge directly imply one another. There is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute, at the same time, power relations. So anyways, anyways, the worldview of the, of the postmodern neo-Marxists is that everybody is basically not an individual, because um, that's really a fiction, and it's a Eurocentric patriarchal fiction at that, but a member of whatever their identity group happens to be, and there's no real possibility of communication between identity groups, hence phenomena like cultural appropriation, um, and so it's a war of all groups against all groups, and it's all, it's nothing but a struggle for power. And Did you notice in the clip how Peterson said that postmodernists don't believe in overarching narratives? 
but he called them neo-Marxists instead. Well, there's just a problem. The belief of overreaching narratives is a huge part of Marxism. Hence, he is showing here with this slip-up that he doesn't understand what the hell he's talking about. Which one is it, Peterson? Are you talking about postmodernists who don't believe in an overarching narrative? Or are you talking about Marxists who do? You can't have your cake and eat it too. Also, Jordan, postmodernists are not denying the self. They're not denying the individual. They're just saying that the idea of yourself is something that changes throughout the ages. Here's another quote from Derrida to highlight this. The subject is absolutely indispensable. I don't destroy the subject. I believe that at a certain level, both of experience and of philosophical and scientific discourse, one cannot get along without the notion of subject. Derrida's claims throughout his career were never really about identity politics as such. It was really more about general culture, about exposing the idea of rigid ideas as arbitrary in themselves. Derrida and Foucault never really intended to support the idea of identity politics at all. Does postmodernism lead to identity politics? I would argue so, yes. I think it's pretty obvious that postmodernism has damaged the idea of the self, and it has caused damage on college campuses, no doubt. And ideas of social constructivism have ruined a large part of academic endeavor. Jordan Peterson is completely correct, in my opinion, when he points this out. But it is important to be truthful to the core material you're criticizing. And the truth is, and the truth is, I just cannot find any kind of source material to back up the claim that Derrida and Foucault in any way supported the notion of identity politics. You may remember before when I said that Peterson himself ironically uses postmodernist rhetorical vices to argue against postmodernism, or what he perceives to be postmodernism. Well, this is actually one of those cases. By taking the very nuanced ideas of Derrida and Foucault, and trying to put them in very rigid terms to his audience like he's done in the clips I've shown you, he's engaging in the very same thought pattern that Derrida and Foucault, ironically throughout their career, criticized. Jordan Peterson is living proof that some hardline rigid ideas really are just as abstract as the ideas that they criticize. Oh, the irony. Another example of how Jordan Peterson himself is kind of a postmodernist at least in terms of his rhetorical vices, can be seen in the last video that I uploaded on Jordan Peterson. I'm once again going to show you a short clip of what I showed you in that video, just to make my point. So, it seems to me that you're saying that the reductio ad absurdum of Darwinian conception of knowledge would be if we ever learned certain truths that got us all killed, well then that would prove that these things weren't true or that this was an intellectual dead end. Yeah, they weren't true enough. I would say, if knowing what is true got you all killed, well then that would be a truth that would be worth knowing, but wouldn't make it less true, right? So if I say, okay, okay, so that, okay, so that's, that's, okay, so that's an answer for one. I understand what you're saying, and I don't see that there's any logical problem with it, but I would say that we're actually starting from different fundamental axioms. Like, the fundamental axiom that I'm saying with is something that was basically expressed by Nietzsche. It's a definition of truth. And so, I would say, if it doesn't serve life, it's not. We need a concept of truth that allows us to make statements like that, but your concept of truth is collapsing everything back to whether we survive. Right, whether, 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 whether we survive happily, right? No. Yes, we survive. Any concern about whether it is useful or compatible with your own survival even to tell these truths. Okay, well then I would say that I don't think the facts are necessarily true. I say that I don't think the facts are necessarily true. I say that I don't think the facts are necessarily true. It can be very difficult for people to understand what you mean and for you to understand what they mean when you use truth as a synonym for, as you just said, correct. A fact may be correct, but it's not true. Right. It seems it's, it's counterproductive and you lose nothing by granting that the truth value of a proposition can be evaluated whether or not it's a fact worth knowing, whether or not it's dangerous to know. No, but that's the thing I don't agree with, because I, I think that that's the kind of conception of what constitutes a fact. Does it fact present a moral danger to be a moral danger to understand? And I, think I, I don't think we are disagreeing. I think you are committed to elevating the concept of truth, or what you imagine to be elevating it, into this kind of moral stratosphere where it entails yes, goodness. That is, that is precisely and exactly what I'm doing. There's no yes. Jordan Peterson has no problem with redefining terms, with questioning the very nature of truth itself. Sounds kind of familiar to a certain group of people, right? Jordan Peterson's idea of pragmatism is not only incredibly unpragmatic, it's downright insane. And it's the same kind of bullshit that you expect from a postmodernist professor. Let me show you what I mean. To highlight the problem of the idea of evolved truths, let's take a look at sound. There really is no such thing as sound per se. There are definitely waves of compressed air in our atmosphere, 
and there are definitely different frequencies of compression of the air. But what you would call a note doesn't actually exist. The frequency for it does, but the actual note itself, no. It's something we invented to create music. Music doesn't actually exist. The compressed air and the frequencies we hear, they're real. But the actual music, no. That is just what we perceive with our brain. Now, so far, so good, right? However, we can all still agree that there is such a thing as music, just not physically speaking. Again, the sound waves exist, the frequencies exist, but the actual notes that make up the musical piece, it doesn't actually exist. And still, we can all perceive music because we all agree that music is a thing, even though it's not. This is actually so pragmatic that we can all recognize the same kind of song from non-existent notes. To simply be honest about the nature of music, for instance, I don't have a problem with. The problem is, however, that Jordan Peterson wants to apply the same kind of unpragmatic pragmatism to the idea of truth itself. And this is where we get into batshit insane territory. The problem is, if we were to apply the way Jordan Peterson actually views the idea of truth to reality, nothing would function anymore. Because no longer would you be able to play a piece of music to someone and they would be able to agree with you that it's the same song as you're listening to right now because, hey, music doesn't actually exist. People wouldn't be able to listen to the news because they could just as well argue that, hey, the reporter is actually telling me this while you may hear that. And you wouldn't be able to agree on the news actually being spoken about. You wouldn't even be able to argue against the delusions of someone who's schizophrenic because they could just say to you, speech doesn't actually exist, so what's to say that what you're hearing from other people speaking is more valid than what I hear from my own head? And now we get to the creme de la creme, the part that shocked a lot of people in my last video. From most things we want to talk about, there is no implication of danger on that scale at all, and we still have to make strong truth claims. We can make this as prosaic or as, or as weird as you want. If someone says that your wife is cheating on you, presumably that's within the realm of possibility, provided you have a wife, and you're going to want evidence. And what would constitute evidence? Well, here's, here's evidence. I saw it in a dream. Well, that's bad evidence. Well, here's evidence. I hired a prophet investigator, and here are 17 pictures of her in various locations, the man you've never seen before, and he looks like Brad Pitt. Now, all of a sudden, presumably you're interested, right? Now, the claim about whether or not she's cheating on you is an intelligible claim. If it drills down on what it might mean, does, it, does she have to be having sex with the person to be cheating on you? Well, let's say, yeah, she does. Okay, so then it's a claim about what she's actually doing with this person in a locker room somewhere when you're not around. That's a claim that has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you wind up killing yourself based on your reaction to this unhappy truth. If you then wound up killing yourself, we can say at the end of the day, well, it would be better if he hadn't known that. It would certainly be better if he hadn't done that. It would have been better if he had married a different woman. Surely we'd want to say that. It might be a better if he would have paid attention to his damn marriage and to attribute the, sure. to attribute the cause of his advice to the existence of the photographs. This is why I brought Josh Green, is that investigations into this kind of really always bring the things Jordan, you have to grant one day, here's one piece that doesn't get moved here. You cannot move the piece that, because you killed yourself, it's not true that you was having an affair. That move is not open to you, and you're acting like it is. You know, I think we've been going down this road for so long that I'm not exactly capable of them at the moment about making the micro uh, example, macro example leap because you're making a case there that it's sort of quasi associated with science, that's the photographic evidence and the realism that's associated with that. And then you're making the claim that, you know, it's not true that she wasn't having an affair. I have to take that apart more. He killed himself, but you're throwing a lot of things into that example that I believe are contextually important to my unpacking the ethics behind it. You know, because you're equating the fact that she had an affair to him committing suicide, which, you know, there's a whole backstory there. And it also depends to a large degree precisely on what you mean by an affair, which is something that you brush over. So, you know, you're acting, that's the problem with these damn micro examples, is that... Yes, Schrodinger's cheating wife. Did she cheat, or did she not cheat? Well, it, it kind of depends, really. Uh, maybe she cheated on him, maybe she didn't. I, 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 I don't know. I don't, maybe, it depends on what you mean with truth. Uh, also, the bit about micro example is just priceless. Micro example. Get, get the fuck out of here, Peterson. Come on. Like I mentioned in my last video, Jordan Peterson's idea of truth can be summarized in these bullet points. You can only truly know your evolved delusions. Jordan Peterson also defines truth as, quote, that which serves life. And he also thinks that simply because something is immoral, it is not true. With Jordan Peterson's reasoning, you might as well just cross the American to Mexican border without a passport because, hey, there is really no such thing as borders. It's just a man-made construct, after all. And a passport, it's just a piece of paper. Why would it be inherently worth more as an identification than me insisting that I really am who I am? After all, all truth is relative to the observer. Yes, Jordan Peterson is very much acting like a postmodernist. Any concern about whether it is useful or compatible with your own survival, even, to tell you the truth. Hey, well, then I would say that I don't think that facts are necessarily true. 
So I don't think that scientific facts, even if they're correct from within the domain that they were generated, I don't think that that necessarily makes them true. I know that I'm gerrymandering the definition of truth, but I'm doing that on purpose because I'm trying to nest truth into the Darwinian framework, which I think is a moral framework. And I think that your, the logic of your argument about morality is going to push you in the same direction inevitably. You're choosing, following Nietzsche here, you're choosing to use the word true. You're choosing to freight it with some moral concerns that will make it very difficult for people to understand what you mean and for you to understand what they mean when you use truth as a synonym for, as you said, correct. A fact may be correct, but it's not true. Right. So this, is, this is counterproductive, and you lose nothing by granting that the truth value of a proposition can be evaluated whether or not this is a fact worth knowing or whether or not it's dangerous to know. No, and that's the thing I don't agree with, because I, I think that that's the kind of conception of what constitutes a fact that does in fact present a moral danger to people. A moral 